This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. We begin today's show in Baltimore, where protests over the death of Freddie Gray have entered their fifth day. The 27-year-old African-American man died Sunday from spinal injuries, one week after Baltimore police arrested him. His family and attorney say his voice box was crushed and his spine was, quote, 80 percent severed at his neck. A preliminary autopsy report showed Gray died of a spinal injury. Video shot by a bystander shows Gray screaming in apparent agony as police drag him to a van. You can hear a bystander's voice. His leg look broke. Look at his leg. Look at his leg. That boy's leg look broke. His leg broke and y'all dragging him like that. Another witness said the police bent Freddie Gray like a pretzel. Gray was then held inside a police van for 30 minutes. Police said, quote, during transport to Western District via wagon transport, the defendant suffered a medical emergency and was immediately transported to shock trauma via medic. The Department of Justice is now investigating Gray's death for possible civil rights violations. Since 2011, Baltimore has paid roughly $6.3 million to settle police misconduct claims. Baltimore authorities say five of the six officers involved in the arrest of Gray have now given statements to the Baltimore police. One has not. They remain suspended with pay. Baltimore Police Union attorney Michael Davey told reporters the officers were right to trace Gray, to chase Gray, after he ran away when a lieutenant made eye contact with him. They pursued Mr. Gray. They detained him for an investigative stop. Had he not had a knife or an illegal weapon on him, he would have been released. They know what role they played in the arrest of uh, Mr. Gray. Uh, what we don't know and what we're hoping the investigation uh, will tell us is what happened inside the back of the van. He was placed in the transport van. Uh, whether he was seatbelted in, uh, I don't believe he was. Our position is something happened in that van. We just don't know what. Do you think any of the six officers committed a crime that day? No. Yeah, unequivocally, and what makes you say? Based on the information that I know, no. Well, on Wednesday, our next guest spoke with residents of the Gilmore Homes housing projects in West Baltimore, where Freddie Gray was arrested, including one woman who says she witnessed officers loading him into the back of a police van. In a minute, we'll be joined by our guest, Eddie Conway of The Real News Network. But first, this is a clip of his interview. How you doing? I'm Eddie Conway. Uh, I'm Tamika. Okay. Oh, cool. I'm Jacqueline Jackson. I'm what? seeing it. Yeah. I live 1628 Mount Moore Court. My kitchen faces Mount Street. Okay. The paddy wagon was right there. They took the young man out, beat him some more. The man wasn't responding. They took him by his pants, and he was dragged. Mm -hmm. And I asked them to call the ambulance. They told me to mind my business. Mm -hmm. I told them it is my business. Mm -hmm. And they just threw him up in there. The boy wasn't hollering or nothing. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't hollering or nothing. You, you, how can you holler if you ain't saying nothing? Mm -hmm. They killed that young man. They killed him. Eddie Conway of The Real News Network interviewing residents of the Gilmore Homes housing project where Freddie Gray was arrested. He was there last night when protesters called for justice in his case marched again. And he joins us now in Baltimore. Eddie Conway is executive producer of The Real News Network, also a former Black Panther leader in Baltimore, Maryland, who was released from prison last year after serving 44 years for a murder he denies committing. We spoke to him last March, just 24 hours after he was released. We're all also joined by Dominique Stevenson, who was arrested at last night's protest in Baltimore over the death of Freddie Gray. She's program director for the American Friends Service Committee's Friend of a Friend program, which fosters the peaceful resolution of conflict and promotes reconciliation and healing inside Maryland's criminal justice system. She's also co-author of Eddie Conway's memoir, Martial Law, The Life and Times of a Baltimore Black Panther. Dominique, let's begin with you. Can you explain why you were protesting yesterday? Yesterday and how you got arrested. Well, I was protesting because this is there's a history in Baltimore of not so much uh, police shootings, but people being beaten to death by the police. There's a long history. Um, 
I feel that I needed to be there with the community. We had, for some time, been doing work in Gilmore Homes Housing Project, and I wanted to, you know, be there to stand in solidarity with the community. I was arrested because, at some point, a young woman, Michaela Price, decided to commit civil disobedience. She's 17 years old. I, one, did not want or even trust her being in police custody alone, and so I came over the barrier to accompany her. And Dominique, uh, the state of Maryland also has the highest, uh, uh, sorry, um, Baltimore has the highest rate of incarceration in the state of Maryland. Could you connect that to the action that you took and um, to what happened to, to Freddie Gray? Yes. One, if you uh, look at statistics, that particular neighborhood, Sandtown Winchester is the neighborhood in Baltimore, has actually the highest incarceration rate in the state. And you cannot disconnect that rate of incarceration from the style of aggressive policing that takes place. We've talked to many young men. Okay, of course, there, there's crime in that community. There are no jobs in that community. There's no economic development happening in that community. But the, the other issue is the harassment of police, the unnecessary detainment of police. People don't know what Freddie Gray's history may have been with those folks that he saw and why making eye contact simply made him run. And so I think that we really need to t take a look at how policing is done in Baltimore. It, it cannot be disconnected from our high incarceration rate. Black folks make up almost 80 percent of the total population in the Maryland prison system, yet we comprise about 28 percent of the population in the state. Eddie Conway, you were interviewing people um, in the area. You, we just saw you talking to a witness. This issue of there being video of Freddie Gray in the takedown, when they are dragging him over to the uh, or trying to carry him over uh, to the police van, it looks like he cannot move. Um, Yesterday, the police union spokesperson, attorney, um, said, oh, you know, that's what these perps do. Uh, they have to be dragged because they won't walk. Can you respond to this, based on what you heard from witnesses? Yes, uh, from and, and I interviewed perhaps 30 people from that community that was in that area or even heard the incident or witnessed the incident. The incident actually occurred under one of the police cameras that has been operating for years in that community, and they have been using that camera to make numerous drug arrests over the years. And for some reason, that day, that camera did not work. Uh, it, uh, it would have been directly over Freddie Gray's head. Uh, it would have recorded everything that took place. One of the things that people say that uh, some one of the police dropped down on his back, on his neck, with his knee, and from that point on, he was incapacitated. And uh, later, they even took him back out of the uh, van and— uh, shackled his legs and did something else to him and threw him back in the van. Uh, so as far as all the witnesses can tell, and, and all of them report, that he was already fatally injured when they put him in in the first place. That video that we saw with them dragging him to the van, he was already incapacitated. And has anyone, Eddie Conway, given an explanation for why that camera uh, didn't work that day? No one knows why that camera didn't work. Everybody in the community says that that camera has been used consistently over the years to lock people up uh, and used for evidence in drug arrests and, and other arrests. Uh, one of the things is, and I guess I want to raise this issue, uh, uh, when is it a crime for a, a man to run somewhere? People run throughout the city all the time. People. Uh, 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 constantly running. So uh, you get executed because you run?
Now, can you clarify, for people who haven't been following this case, um, the police union attorney yesterday said in a high-crime area, yes, you can arrest someone if they simply run. And no one alleges anything other than that Freddie Gray ran. What about this? Well, it's not a high-crime area. It's a broken windows police area in which people and residents in that area are arrested for sitting on their own steps. They are laudering in their own community on their own steps, and they're harassed constantly. And this has been the reports that uh, I have received. Uh, the Real News and myself and friend of a friend, we have been going down in that area trying to establish a relationship with the people in that area. And one of the things that they said is that they're not even allowed to set out in the area on their steps, even though they live there, with the, the police will come and harass them. That level of harassment causes verbal uh, 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 responses. It causes physical contact. It causes people to be arrested. And before you know it, they have an arrest record, even as I'm talking 10, 11, 12, 13-year-old juveniles, and they end up in the prison system. And that's why that becomes the high crime system, uh, uh, the high crime uh, area. Um, um, a, statement, um, a statement from the Fraternal Order of Police Lodge 3, Baltimore's police union, compared the protesters calling for justice in the death of Freddie Gray to a lynch mob. During a news conference Wednesday, reporters questioned the union's president um, about the comparison. I just was reading this statement you all just handed out to us just now, and uh, just reading it, the tone, I mean, it says that uh, the images on TV look and sound much like a lynch mob. Are you, I mean, uh, what do you have I, to expect? I, I, to I haven't that seen that. that. I haven't seen Because they've already tried and convicted the officers, and that's just unfair. They still get their day in court. They did not give up their constitutional rights when they became a law enforcement officer. That's what I was getting at to that. Some of the, the, uh, the protesters and some of the stuff I've been watching on the news, they want them put in prison. Well, they have been charged, number one. Number two, they still get their day in court. So how can they request that they be put in jail? We haven't even got to that process yet. The, the investigation has to be completed before we move forward. Are you concerned with the tone of the, of the statement at all? No, because I was quite offended by some of the things that were being said yesterday. Me personally, that's coming from me. That didn't come from Mike in the law firm. This says, that, this says it comes from the Fraternal Order of yes, Police. Yes, that's so, I'm the president. So, are you likening these these citizens protesting in this rally to a, to a lynch mob, specifically? They, well, let's put it this way: if if they're tried, convicted, and they would have put them in jail, where's the due process with that? That's Gene Ryan, uh, the police union president. Dominique Stevenson, this likening to a lynch mob. Um, yesterday, you did get arrested. You went over the barrier. What is your reaction uh, to the police union president? Well, actually, if you take a look at what happened to Freddie Gray, he was tried, convicted, and executed. And so I, I resent likening people who are simply protesting and demonstrating and responding to a situation that was extremely unjust in their community to a lynch mob. As a person of African descent and understanding the history of lynching in this country, I find that statement offensive. I think that people are very frustrated because this is not the first time that this situation has occurred in Baltimore. I think that people have spent years of seeing these situations occur. People have experienced police brutality on so many levels, whether it's witnessing uh, the mistreatment of loved ones or community members or experiencing it firsthand. There were so many people in the community yesterday who were willing to come up and talk about their experiences with the police, that this is something that has been so harmful. Uh, to black communities across the country, but particularly here in Baltimore. So I don't, I think that it is um, basically it's a statement designed to, to garner attention and to garner a response. I think that people have a right to protest. They should continue to do that. But along with that, we need to really begin to organize. We need to take control of how policing is done in our communities 
and that will begin to resolve some of the problems. Dominique Stevenson, and, and, we want to thank you for being with us. Eddie, I'd like to ask you to wait for one moment, because you'll be staying with us. Eddie Conway, okay. um, with the Baltimore-based um, Real News Network, uh, we are also going to be joined by the former president of the Baltimore City Council. This is Democracy Now!, major protest plan for today in Baltimore over the death of Freddie Gray. He was taken down by police on April 12th. He died on April 19th. Uh, his family and lawyers say 80 percent of his—that 80 percent of his spine was severed. Stay with us.